Hi everybody, Karen Alari here. So we're at the block-in stage of our little painting fall vineyard. And I want you to be sure to watch this video all the way through if you're painting along with me before you get started painting. Because I go through a lot of changes during the painting, so if you follow along you might get a little frustrated. But that's the point of the block-in stage, and that's why I wanted to leave all of this in here, all of the changes, all of the adjustments that I make. And you can see how the process is creative. It takes time. It takes time to develop. I like to call this block-in stage the foundation stage because really it's the time that I've learned to take to get to know my painting, to understand how the colors and the values and the shapes are going to work together to tell my story and to create a mood and to really get across what I'm trying to say beyond just rendering the image the way it is in my reference this is a stage of the painting where I really dig in and start to interact with the painting react to the painting feel the painting and then have it sort of speak to me and show me where to go so that I can I can express what it is I'm trying to say with this painting. And that all kind of sounds a little bit lofty and a little bit overblown, but I guess what I'm trying to uh, express is just this feeling of taking your time. What you're going to see in this in this uh, video as I go is about half of the time maybe even a third of the time that I actually took to do this and the the video is almost an hour long and that's because I spend just as much time looking and contemplating as I do actually painting and so you can see that in these little uh, little jumps these edited jumps that I make because those are the times that I just sitting there staring at the canvas so <laughs> there wasn't a whole lot for you to see so let's just jump right in and, and look at what I'm doing here. Um, I started by putting in the values of the sky. So I used some, some white and some ultramarine blue with a little bit of orange in it just to neutralize that color a little bit. And I'm trying to really focus on values here. I want those relative lights and darks. So I put in those very lightest areas first and now I'm coming into this shadow area in the foreground because that's going to have some of the very darkest areas that I'm working on with the painting. So you see that I've put, I'm putting in these dark reds, sort of a reddish color, used alizarin crimson with a little bit of ultramarine blue in it. And I know I'm kind of covering up the piles of paint in this uh, portion of the video so I'm going to try to explain as I go what colors that I'm pulling. So there I've started with some purple and I've added some of that quinacridone gold and what that's going to do is create a very dark dark. That's going to be pretty much the darkest dark in the image and that's those tree trunks and branches over there on the left hand side. So what I'm doing is comparing. I'm establishing my end posts my darkest darks and my lightest lights because in this stage of the block in the foundation you, that's the major thing you're thinking about is values how light and dark are things compared to the other areas and you're gonna see I'm gonna keep shifting those as I add the other areas of paint in I'll keep shifting those values until the harmony is right until I can see the light until I can see the forms, until I can see those shapes, those big compositional shapes. I'm using a brush that's about a half an inch wide and I'm not thinking at all about detail. In fact, I'm trying to ignore the detail. I'm squinting my eyes and I'm trying to keep my focus on the big picture. Sometimes that can be a real challenge because we want to look at those details. Our, our mind goes immediately to the the details and the colors. You know, I used to skip this stage in my painting. I used to just go, want to get straight off to the front, fun part, which is creating those those 
finished images, seeing that finished painting come from the canvas. And what I would do by doing that is I would lose the big picture. I would maybe finish off one little area of my painting with the detail and then I move to the next painting and I'd kind of focus from my reference to the painting one little area at a time and I would lose that really important concept that all of the areas of the painting have to have to speak to each other they have to be part of a big picture and what would always really uh, struggle with at that point was the values. They wouldn't relate to each other. I'd maybe start out light and then I'd move darker, but I wouldn't have that comparison, that, that reference one area to the other. So it wouldn't work together the image as a whole. And then maybe I would get one area that I really liked and the detail was really good and ooh, that really looks like that thing. And then I wouldn't want to change it. I wouldn't want to fix it. If that whole area was too dark or too light or the wrong color, I would get I would get too invested in it. And I wouldn't want to fix it and change it. So the painting as a whole would suffer. So instead of doing that, you want to really focus on big 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 shapes, color, and value. And make sure that that's creating your mood, that that's uh, showing your focal point, that that's leading your eye, that that's expressing the story that you're trying to tell. And you can do all those things in this, this simple shapes. You, you don't need your detail to do it. Your detail is just the frosting on the cake. So going back to what colors I'm actually using. I'm using here some yellows and I've neutralized that yellow with a little bit of purple. What I'm trying to do is find those background trees back there. You've got those those gold um, vines, the leaves on the vines, and then you've got those gold trees in the background. So I'm thinking through this process to myself, how can I create a separation between those two colors? How can I show that these golds are in the background and, and these golds in the vines, my focal point, are more important? So I'm working through first neutralizing the yellow a little bit to see if that helps set off the yellows in my vine. And then I added a little white to it to see if that'll push it further in the distance. I know I'm going to intensify the yellows of those vines, but you'll find that yellow is a pretty transparent color. So you're going to need to put a few layers on that yellow to get a really rich chromatic yellow color. So I've put down one layer of just almost bright tube yellow, and now I'm letting that dry first. I'm experimenting here with adding those sort of purplish trees that are also in the background. So I'm sticking close to my reference photo at this point, trying to establish what I see there first, get in uh, the correct values and the correct colors, and then from there, I'm going to move on. I'm going to I'm going to start interacting more with the image, developing the image, developing my story. This is really the most creative part of the process, and it might not seem so, but what you're doing is creating your image and and understanding where you want to go. So now filling in this foreground tree, so the foreground tree is in shadow. It's got a little bit of light poking through so there's little spots of light in the reference that are more vividly colored. And then it, there's all these different colors. There's greens, there's golds, there's purples, there's browns, there's yellows, all these different colors. And I'm, I'm going to need to address that. But first I want to address the overall value. So this image has this sort of frame of the tree, foreground tree in shadow, and that frame of the darker values is what sets off the light behind it, the light in the scene itself. And I know I'm going to want to play that up because those golden vines are my focal point in this image. So in order to establish that as a focal point, to I need to create contrast. 
I need to create contrast and color and in value and in detail and in uh, edges. All those things I'll work on creating and I'm going to do all those things in this foundation stage. <clears throat> so I've got that some of the darks laid in there in the tree and I'm relating the darks behind that tree in that background area and I'm trying to establish how dark I need to go. Now I'm back in the, I'm in these still in the foreground tree and I'm still trying to establish those darks. There's also some of this dark in the uh, stakes that are holding up the vines. They're in the foreground so they're going to have that same value of darkness. Now as that progresses back into the image I'm going to be working a lot in these values with creating the change from foreground clear into the background in the in the vines themselves so I'm going to have that shift and I'll be working on that as I go so now I have some green that's the hookers green that I started with adding some yellow and some white and I'm looking for the green of those vines you can see the foreground shows that light green of the grasses there, not the vines, but the grasses. And again, establishing these values, especially in acrylic paint, often takes a number of layers because the acrylic paint is going to dry darker. So I'm going to start at this place with the green and then I'll see how it compares to the other values and I'll work on it from there. Later on in the image, I'm in the process, I might decide to change that. But right now, I'm just sticking to trying to establish what I see in my image. I added a little ultramarine blue and some more white because I'm thinking about that the distance part of this of this area. It's one thing in this this image that isn't doesn't really show up in the reference photo, and that's a shift in value and color and intensity as we go into the distance. And if I want to show that depth, I know I'm going to have to have, I'm going to have to push that. I'm going to have to establish a gradation of color and value and chroma as I move back. And if I don't do that, then you won't get that feeling of depth in the image. So I'm doing that right now in the block in using a cooler and a lighter and a more neutral version of that green in the background to start to develop that depth. So here's my yellow again. I've got pure yellow. I'm adding a little bit of red to that. Red is a very uh, strong color in relationship to the yellow. So you you know you're always you want to be very very careful how much of that red you add because it's very strong and it'll take over the mix very quickly. So what I'm doing is I added that tiny bit of red because I want to warm up that yellow a little bit. I want to make sure it's a very warm, rich yellow. And I'm adding another layer of yellow onto the yellow that I have down there. As I said, it's going to be kind of a, a phase kind of a thing with this yellow because it's so transparent. Back to my alizarin crimson adding a little bit of that purple to it and working again in thinking about what color those darks are going to be in the foreground. I really like those purplish colors and I'm pushing those more in the image because that purple is going to create the, the contrast in color between the yellow and the purple because those are complementary colors. So those are going to help me set off the yellows in my focal point area in the vines and help create that interest and that contrast. So I'm looking at some greens now because in the uh, reference photo there's a lot of green in that tree. I know I want to keep it dark and I've already established that I'm going to keep this area a little darker than it's actually showing in the reference because I want to have that contrast and value. So I'm exploring 
what kind of greens would I use up here? Do I like those greens? These are kind of cool greens, and I'm uh, thinking about those. Now I've got some of my uh, Indian yellow, a little bit of orange, a little bit of white. I'm going back in with yet another layer on those yellow vines, trying to establish that really rich color that I want. So it's a, it's you know, it's not this. You don't necessarily know. Okay, what color am I going to use to get the color of the vines? It's a process. So it's a process of trial and error and trying things out. And that's the beauty of acrylics is that you can have as many layers as you want and you can still just layer one over the next. You don't have to worry about making a mistake. So going back to I neutralized that yellow a little more, added uh, a little bit of that blue. Now I'm adding a little blue to neutralize it even more. A little bit of purple, a little bit of Quinn gold there, some white. So I'm still exploring how can I set those distant trees off from my yellow vines. I like having that distance behind it, but I'm not sure how I'm going to do that. You see here, I feel like I'm building up too many layers. I want to keep the paint flat at this stage in the painting. I can have a lot of layers, but I don't want to build up a lot of texture yet. So I'm scraping that off. Don't want to bother waiting for it to dry because I know it's the wrong color. I know I don't like it. So I went ahead and scraped that off. You can also use your paper towel and wipe that off because I'm still exploring. What is that color going to be? How am I going to create that background? This is the point when you start really interacting with your painting. Looking more at the painting than you do at the reference. Because I've got pretty much basically in what I see in the reference photo. But now I want to establish my version of it. I'm going to spend more time looking at the painting itself. So now I've moved to sort of a greenish color back there, sort of a added a little more blue to the yellow. Now here's my Indian yellow again. Adding into that some of my hands of yellow trying to find a clean part of my uh, paint. That's something that you have to be careful of is to be sure to keep, you know, if you want to work, you're working in a really clear area. This is a very chromatic area that I want the paint. So be sure that you, you know, you grab nice clean color. And if you don't have any more clean color in your piles, be sure to add some more because you'll just get frustrated if you, uh, have dirty color to start with and you can't find your clean colors. So I had put one more layer of just pure yellow with a little Indian yellow trying to build up the strength of those yellow vines and now I'm adding more sort of reds you know alizarin crimson with quin gold to push the color of that foreground tree more to the reds. At this point you know, I wasn't really happy with some of the colors going on in that tree, and I realized, you know, I really like the sort of orangish colors of the tree as a harmony to that, to the rest of the colors in my painting. Trying again with green and blue, seeing if I like that green in the tree. At this point, I've taken out edited out a lot of time that I spent just sitting and looking at that painting because basically I'm not really happy with where that foreground tree is going. I'm not really happy with that green or with the color harmonies that that's creating. My concept is I want to create you know a connection between the green and the grass and the green in the tree. I don't want that green in the grass to be the only place I see green. So I'm experimenting with how much green do I want to put in that tree. You can see I spent some more time contemplating there. And now I'm coming back with an orange color. So I've used my orange, some quin gold, some yellow. And I'm thinking about 
Do I want some orange? Do I want to push the uh, color in those vines more to an orange color? So I'm just adding little touches of that here and there to step back and to think about that and to look at it. So going back to my alizarin crimson with some ultramarine blue, creating a purplish color, adding some white to that. That might, might have had some straight purple in it too. And I'm thinking, hmm, after quite a bit of contemplation, I like the way that those purpley colors in the background are cool and they're contrasting to the yellow of the vines. So I'm developing more the trees that are on the sides in the image, have some of those trees back there. And then I'm moving into just thinking that, you know, I really like the way that purple contrasts against the yellow in the vines. It's not that way in the image, but I'm thinking about it. Now I've gone back to some blue with ultramarine blue and I'm neutralizing that with a tiny bit of the orange and some white. So I'm reestablishing those background hills. How dark do I want those? I want, I want those background trees to set off against the background. So I try that and realize that went a little too dark. Let me lighten that up a little bit more. I'm just reestablishing that shape back there the shape of those mountains and the shape as they touch the background hills. So contemplating a little more and starting again the next day actually, um, I've had time to think about it and to look at this image, set it on my easel, look at it as I walk by during the day, and come up with some new ideas, but first I'm Re-establishing my yellows here, again, getting my really rich yellow color. These underlayers are dried, and I realize I really want to see that shape, the, that yellow shape. So I'm coming back in, and I, what I also realized as I looked at it more is that I'd gone a little wonky with my drawing, and the vines the placement and the shape of the vines, the placement and the shape of the hills was a, wasn't quite where I wanted it to be. The, uh, so I went back in and looked at my drawing again, reestablished where those shapes should be, how far up the vines should be, where, how the angles should be. And so I'm reestablishing that and creating a stronger presence with that yellow, filling in those whole shapes, those big shapes, with the yellow to help establish that. Sometimes it takes just going back to your drawing. Um, later I'm going to go back in and actually redraw the grid over my painting and so I can really see where I've gone off in my drawing. Oftentimes as you're doing the block in, you know the shapes will just kind of keep growing as you're as you're doing it. So I reestablished the perspective, the shapes, and the placement of those. Now coming back in with my sky color, my background mountain color, which is variations of ultramarine white with a little bit of orange added to neutralize that color. You know it's in the background so it's a little neutral. You want to be careful that you don't have too vivid or too chromatic of a color back there. Remember to rinse off your brush and dry it off in between your color mixing. You want to keep that brush clean. You don't want to have uh, a lot of paint globbed up, up on your brush, especially down at the base of it. So oftentimes you just need to rinse it and uh, keep it clean so you don't get those other colors mixing in. So th this is where I've determined that I've gone too high with my mountains. I'd lost the original shapes that I wanted back there. Things were just crowding in and that whole area had moved up on the canvas. 
So I can easily reestablish that at this point. I don't have any detail in. I don't have anything that I'm, you know, fallen in love with because I'm just keeping to big basic shapes. So I don't have any problem just completely moving all that down and painting over where I was before to reestablish the height of those mountains. I just wanted more air back there. I wanted more more of the uh, sky, more of the mountains, more of those blue colors showing through because those lovely blues and those light colors are really going to set off uh, the golds and yellows of the vines. But you can see it took it took me a while setting back and thinking about it, sleeping on it overnight. I just wasn't happy with the image, but I wasn't sure why. Coming back, establishing the correct value that I want in those mountains back there. Remember those uh, acrylic paints are going to dry a little darker, so especially in those light colors. You have to be careful with that and push your color a little lighter than you think you want it. I've got my alizarin crimson, some purple, some white. Going back in with a little more purple, some Indian yellow. Finding what I'm looking for in here now is that those background tree colors. I knew I liked the direction I was going with those, you know, reddish purplish trees back there. So now I've decided to do away completely with the concept of the gold trees behind the gold vines and instead really push that color more towards the purples. The purple is going to contrast with the yellow and give me and set that color off so that I get that vibrancy of the uh, gold vines really sort of interacting and contrasting with that complementary color of purple. I don't want it to be too bright. I want it to keep it a little neutral, a little cool, because it is in the background. But I'm reestablishing those shapes, how high up the vines are going, lowering them back down a little bit to where I want them so that I can get that pleasing composition. So really, you know, at this point, you're really uh, interacting with that painting. You're really looking at the painting itself as opposed to the reference and thinking about what do I like. You'll be able to notice I'm looking back less and less to the image that's on my computer screen to the left and instead I'm just looking at my painting and interacting with it. So I got it in there in that sort of a dark value then I decided to shift that to a lighter value purple just the big basic shape. I also know that along the side here to the left there's an area of trees that's coming toward us. The trees in the back are a flat plane going horizontally but over to the left of the vines there's a row of trees that is progressing from foreground to background just like the vines are. So I need to establish that difference that change in plane so it's it doesn't look like that's another horizontal line of trees but that that's a line of trees that progresses from forward to back so that's got to be done with values a change in value and a change in color now I'm coming back up to the area under the tree which is all those fallen leaves uh, and they're in light so Establishing the light and the shadow is so important at this stage. You want to really see the light in your image. And you're going to do that with that value and that color. I love to have in an image an area that is the same thing. So in this case, the fallen leaves. So it's the same element, both in shadow and in light. That really kind of establishes a sense of, of realism and light in your painting, I think. So 
that that area is going to be really critical. So I'm working on getting that right relationship and value between shadow and light. And sometimes it's tough. You got to go back and forth a few times, looking at it and reestablishing it before you find before it just reads as light. There's no uh, there's no like right or wrong. There's it's just a sense of when you squint at it, when you look in your mirror, you start to see the light. It's very subjective. So when I'm talking about uh, my mirror, I'm talking about behind me, there's a full length mirror set up so that when I look backwards, I'm looking into the mirror. And that gives me a whole different perspective on the painting. It gives me kind of a distance perspective on the painting. You can also do the same thing by just stepping way back from your painting. But as I'm sitting and painting here, I don't want to, you know, jostle the video camera and mess that up by getting up and down a lot. So I'll tend to just look in the mirror and that'll give me that a very similar perspective to stepping way back. Going back in with my Indian yellow and my white and my yellow, again establishing and re-establishing that uh, the, the vines there, how bright are they going to be, how light are they going to be, how much can I push that value, and you, you really have to do it in layers, as I said, with yellows, because they're a uh, very transparent color. So you have to add white to get the brightness, but you still want to get that richness. So if you add a number of layers, you know, oftentimes people will say, well, I can't get, you know, light enough. I can't get it bright enough. You know, well, just add more layers. You can see on there real clearly now, I've drawn my grid back in with my, my uh, light uh, colored pencil there so that I really make sure that I'm hitting those areas that, when I, that I wanted to hit in my initial drawing and get it, maintaining my my uh, perspective with those vines. Working on the greens and shadow now. So there's going to be greens and light and greens and shadow. And the image in that foreground is almost completely covered with the leaves. And at this point in the painting, I'm starting to think, eh, I don't know if I necessarily want to have that just kind of solid area of leaves there. Instead, I think I'm going to bring the greens of the grasses into that foreground a little bit more because there's kind of a kind of a uh, a strange line where the grass stops and the leaves begin, and it doesn't feel real natural, even though that's what's in the image. But this is where you start thinking about your reference photo and you know veering off from it because it's just not necessarily making sense for you in terms of the image and what you're trying to say. So I want to, you know, I just want to have a few fallen leaves on the ground. I want, you know, this this is a fall image and, and we have that going on, but I don't think I necessarily want to have that really strong line straight across where it, where the grass stops and the leaves begin. So instead I'm bringing that lighter green grass in light and the green of the grass in shadow down into the foreground as a way of integrating that green uh, into the whole painting as I was trying to do with the leaves in the tree above. As I'm looking at that I'm also establishing now uh, a shadow so I know that I'm going to have some some more dark underneath uh, the vines that's going to create a little bit of a shadow. So again, hopefully you're watching this all the way through and not just painting along with me necessarily because um, I think you would get a little frustrated with the back and forth that I'm doing. So, you know, at the end of this, you can use my block in image and just block in straight from that if you like, or alternatively, you can start with the reference photo and follow my same process of establishing what how you want to represent this image which may or may not be the way I'm representing it and you might
come to different conclusions or different ways of, of telling the story of this image. So now I've gone back to sort of some shadow colors in those yellow vines. I know there's going to be some shadow and light in the vines themselves. So I'm just laying those in a little bit so I get sort of the comparison going on and I can see, begin to uh, play with those colors and see where I'm going to go. Adding a little more yellow to that purple, a little bit more of that, that mixed greenish color in order to neutralize that purple a little more. As it dried and dried darker, I'm beginning to see that I want this to be lighter again, not quite so dark. The darks are beginning to be so dark, they're coming forward in the image and not staying back in the distance where I want them to stay. And you know, again, I'm with the way the acrylics dry darker, you might find that you have to reestablish that value a couple or three times in order to get that added a little more purple back into that, feeling like it had gone a little too neutral with that background. So I do want that to read as purple, so the purple interacts with the yellow. Adding more purple again into the color, and just a touch of quinacridone gold to neutralize it, establishing kind of shadow side to those background trees, because you know, you'll notice in, in the reference image even, you're always going to have sort of the shadow at the bottom and then a light. So you're going to have a light color and value and a shadow color and value. And I'm realizing that as that darker value is along the bottom, that will interact with the yellow of the vines. So that light of the vines will be set off against the dark of that shadow area. Now I've mixed up more of my sky color because I know I don't want that tree in the foreground to be really solid and heavy. I know that this is a fall tree, a whole bunch of the leaves have already fallen off of it, and I want those lovely shapes that, that you see in the reference photo. You see how you see those shapes that the leaves make against the sky holes? I love that aspect of the painting. So I'm beginning to establish and think about the fact that there's going to be a whole lot of shapes in there that are going to interact and speak to the shapes in the vines down there as well. So adding more of those shadow colors into the tree. These are my purpley colors. So I'm starting to realize that I don't necessarily like the greens in that tree. It's They're there in the image, but I just I don't like the way they're interacting. It doesn't, it's not pleasing to me. Instead, I like the simplicity of the sort of purples and reddish purples and bluish purples. I like the simplicity of those colors that create a real simple statement in the foreground and that those purples in the foreground then interact with the purples in the background. So I'm going over all that green that I've done in the tree and instead um, turning that into shades of, of a cool neutralized purple color. Thinking about that a lot, um, deciding how much I like it, thinking about okay how is that purple going to interact with that line of trees that's along the side of the vines because right now I have that line of tree along the sides in a purple color very similar to the purple that I'm putting up in the tree. So I'm going to have to think about that again. All these uh, choices and interactions with the painting come from trying it. You know, if, if you think, hmm, what? I don't think I like that. Well, let's try this instead. Adding more quinacridone gold to that mix and some more blue, just getting subtle variations of those purplish, goldish, reddish colors of the tree and experimenting. Experimenting with what those colors might be and which ones I like and how they interact with each other 
and how many different sort of shades of that color can I find uh, and create within this foreground area. I know I'm going to get very much more complicated with it or more interact uh, more subtle variations as I move on in the finishing stages of the painting but but right now I'm just looking to establish that that look and I think you may be able to see what that has done so far by simplifying the colors in that foreground tree now those gold vines are really starting to pop and grab your attention as opposed to before when there was a lot of yellows elsewhere in the painting so they weren't set apart they weren't really making a statement in as complete a way as I wanted them to more Quinn gold more purple more ultramarine blue you know just more variations and covering up more of those greens that I had in there and then I stop I look I contemplate you know, try not to think, is this right or is this wrong? You just get a feeling when you when you put down a value in a color that's, that's right for your painting, it just seems to fit. It just seems to settle. They're just, it, the painting just starts to sing together in harmony a little bit. And it's subjective. It's singing to you. And that's the important part. In shadows, you're going to get, you, you have planes in your image, so the upright planes of the tree are going to be your darkest, and then those shadows are flat on the ground. They're going to get a little bit more light bouncing in from the sky. So the colors in the leaves that have fallen on the ground in shadow are going to be a little bit lighter than those up above in the tree. So I'm thinking about that. I'm thinking about my planes. I'm thinking about now that my tree is moving more into the reddish purple colors, what is the shadow color of that reddish purple going to be? So now I've got again my purple, dioxazine purple, and my Indian yellow, and I'm reestablishing that dark, dark that is the trunks. I want that, that shape and that form, and I'm playing with understanding how those shapes are going to work together. You can see how I established a little more the shapes within the leaves, just sort of the big shapes. It's so important not to think about detail, not to think about independent leaves or single leaves, but instead thinking about the overall shape that that tree makes and this with the sky holes and the edges uh, and the areas in between the negative spaces and the positive spaces and how can I make those and how can I make them pleasing so now going back where I had put those trees on the side that were purple they now blend into my tree and don't make sense anymore so instead I've gone back in with a neutralized green color a, a warm goldish green almost a khaki green color so you know, it's got green in it, it's got some red in it, it's got some Indian yellow in it to create uh, just a very neutral mid-tone green. And again, that will set off against what's now my purple trees and against what's now my yellow vines. So I've, I've kind of switched those harmonies entirely from the reference where there used to be red background trees in a green in the foreground trees, I've switched those values because that green is a cooler color, it settles back into the distance more, and the warm purples then come more into the foreground. Again, reestablishing my green grasses, those light colors, once more as they dry, they darken, so I'm coming in yet again with a lighter version of that yellow. I want to keep it very warm. I don't want it uh, to compete too much with the gold of the vines. You can see in the reference image that super bright, almost chartreuse green color that's in the image is competing with the chroma of the vines. It's, it's brighter, it's more, it, 
captures your attention more. And I don't want that to happen in my painting. I want the yellow of the vines to be the stars. So I'm not trying to match that chartreuse fresh green color in the image. Instead, mine's a little bluer, a little cooler, a little more neutral so that the warmest color is, is the yellow of the vines. So I have to, you know, work on the shadow color of of the grasses. Again, later we'll put in some some details and some more shape and form, but what I'm really trying to establish is the grass and shadow and the grass and light. What color is that going to be? How you know, what value is it going to be? What color is it going to be? Because remember, when you're creating a shadow color and a light color of the same thing, it's not just going to be a shift in value, but it'll be a shift in color. So it's going to get cooler. It's going to have more blue in it. Uh, sometimes it will be more neutral. Not always. Sometimes you get your most vivid colors in the shadows, and that really depends on what your story is. For me, I'm going to keep my most vivid colors in this story out in the sunlight and not in the shadow. But I don't want my shadow colors to be ugly. I still want them to be pretty. I just want to keep them as a supporting member of this cast, not you know competing with the lead. Again, reestablishing that light color of the grass Going back and forth, I'm kind of off uh, off camera here with my mix, but it's just a mix of green, the hooker's green, with yellow added and with white added, and seeing how light I want to go with that green. So you can see the other green that looked about this light when I first put it down has once again dried dark, so I'm coming back in. Don't give up on this. Don't give up on the layers because... Uh, sometimes you need to reestablish them a, a number of times to get that light light so that the darks underneath aren't, you know, keep pulling that value down. Stopping, cleaning my brush, contemplating. Again, a lot of contemplation at this point. Really thinking about squinting my eyes. Do I see the light? Do I see the shadow? Are the colors harmonizing together? And at this point, I'm really feeling like I like that that yellow is standing out as the as the star. So I know I've got my focal point established, and I can see my light in the shadow. Now I'm working again on the color of the fallen leaves in light, moving them slightly purpler than they were before. And again, I've, I've pulled that grass way into the foreground. So I wanna, I'm working on how few or how many of those fallen leaves do I want to see? How much, you know, just volume do I want them to take up? How much space do I want them to take up? How spotty is that going to be? You know, enough to establish the light and shadow, but not enough to create that. Uh, that line. I like a, I like a little more of the feeling of looseness, of lightness, just a few leaves on the ground. Okay, now again, I'll let that sit overnight, and I don't always go this many days, but I actually had a lot of other things going on, so it worked out that way this time. But coming back in, uh, I'm using my alizarin crimson, my green, a little bit of white. And what I've thought about over time here, I looked again at the shadow patterns on the grass and I realized the shadows of those posts are actually coming off and to the left. And that's why the shadow under the tree doesn't continue completely over to the right. It, you know, I had been kind of assuming the light being straight overhead and slightly to the left so it was throwing shadows off to the right but in reality the sun is pretty high in the sky but off to the right and that's why you're not getting a full shadow all the way across the foreground of that tree 
even though the branches are all the way across the foreground, it's because the light is off to the right and actually throwing the shadows off to the left. So even though this is going back into a little more detail than I would normally do, uh, establishing your shadow patterns and where your shadow and light is is a really key element of your blocking stage. So after thinking about it and looking at it overnight and wondering why that wasn't making sense to me, I finally realized that was it. That was why the shadow was so short and that was why those shadows going off to the right of my vines weren't making any sense to me. So I came in with some shadow grass color and then I realized, you know, in reality that's not grass that's going to be right under the vines. That's actually going to be dirt. So moving back in, this is kind of, you know, getting a little bit smaller of a shapes for the block in stage, but I felt it was important to establish that that color and that value of the of the shadow patterns. So I'm taking, you know, some some of that dark, um, using some green there, adding some Indian yellow, and a little bit of white, finding what is that you know color going to be. So at this point, I'm just kind of redrawing that pattern on the grass itself with that grassy color. Added a little more blue again. You know, always remember to test your colors on the canvas. You can't, um, you can't decide what color and value something is until you put a little bit up of it up on the canvas and compare it to the colors that you already have up there because it's going to change when you're comparing it to the white of the palette versus the colors that are there. You'd be amazed how drastically different a value and a color can look. So this is my brownish color. I've got Indian yellow. There's a little bit of uh, purple in there to neutralize that yellow into more of a brown color. And I'm looking at getting a color of sort of the dirt in light. So it's a light tannish color that I'm looking for. I'm looking for something that's equivalent value to that green grass I've got going on under there. But just a slightly different color because I'm I know I'm gonna be putting dirt under those vines instead of grass specifically and just playing with that also thinking about you know there's probably gonna be a little bit of dirt that's gonna show through up in that foreground as well and just seeing how that value looks against the value of my uh, of my leaves my fallen leaves Okay, so we got Indian yellow again, and adding a little bit of alizarin crimson, a little bit of white, and lightening up the value of those fallen leaves again. You can see that they've gotten darker, and I'm just thinking about that shadow and thinking about how light I want to go with those colors. A little alizarin crimson, a little Indian yellow, and a little blue. That's going to create some sort of more goldish, brownish colors. A little more alizarin crimson there. Again, comparing that shadow color of the leaves right up against the, uh, the, the color of the leaves, the value of the leaves in light. And there will be a little bit of that shadow color even out in the light because there will be shadows under those fallen leaves. Adding that color up into the tree, knowing that some of those same leaf colors will be in the tree and right before they fall. Got my lighter dirt color again, um, getting rid of some of those shadow colors. This is the sort of greenish, more greenish light color and getting rid of those shadows that I had off to the right and instead uh, keep it because I want to keep them off to the left now. So that purplish shadow color I had there, adding a little more blue to that creates again kind of a, a mid-tone shadowy dirt color. 
So I'm just experimenting with those and laying them in there to make sure I get that value and color where I want it. Getting very close to the end of our block in here and I think you can see how many stages this has gone through from starting to you know basically try to render pretty much what I had in my reference photo and then moving on more and more to my own interpretation of it and shifting those colors. Once more coming back in with that lighter green color and re-establishing those lights yet again. I think I haven't been counting but I'm pretty sure there might be 10 layers on this uh, light area until I'm happy with the sense of light and that I can squint my eyes and see ah now I'm really starting to see the light and the shadow and the way that that uh, harmonizes and sings with each other. Just working on a few final touches, alizarin crimson, some blue, a little more of the ultramarine blue, and some white, and really coming up with a very, you know, purple color there, adding a little more Indian yellow because that yellow is neutralizing my purple because they're complementary colors. So I just wanted to go a little lighter on the tops of those trees. Thinking about that, just really nailing down that color, adding a little more of that alizarin crimson. I want that to read not so bluish purple, but more as uh, the color of the of that same kind of tree that you see in the foreground, and what that would be in the background. So alizarin crimson little more purple, a little more yellow is going to give me a slightly darker version of that color. So all I've really done there is shift that background tree a little bit redder, a little bit away from the blue purple and back into a little bit more of a red purple so that that harmonizes with the red purple tones that I've established in my foreground tree. A little more blue yet to that to create a slightly darker in value and a slightly bluer uh, color to be the shadow color at the bottom of those trees. Again, that darker color is going to really set off my yellows. So there it is. There's my block in after all these permutations it's gone through. So I hope this inspires you to take the time with your block in stage and set the foundation for your, for your good painting. Thanks for joining me.